Good afternoon. My name is Carolyn Vega. I am a curator here at the New York Public Library, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the final public program for the exhibition, Virginia Woolf, A Modern Mind. The exhibition, which is currently on view at the library's flagship building on Fifth Avenue in New York City, offers a survey of Virginia Woolf's life and creative work through intimate diaries, handwritten drafts, family snapshots, original artwork, and first editions of her books. The library holds the bulk of Wolf's papers, and this is the first major exhibition of her work in nearly 30 years. Wolf spent her entire creative life pushing the boundaries of literature. Her goal was, as she said it, to epitomize experience, to fully inhabit the interior lives of her characters. She did this will introduce today's speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Um, my name is Paloma Celis Carvajal and I'm the curator for Latin American, Iberian and Latino collections at the New York Public Library. Welcome everybody and thank you for being with us. Uh, let me start with some practical instructions. We are happy to announce that for this event, we have simultaneous translation into Spanish and also Spanish subtitles. Thanks to Ana Jimenez for her translation work. She's the, that's the name of our, our interpreter today. Um, so to access the Spanish translation of this conversation, please, please click on the globe icon on the bottom right of the Zoom screen and select listen in Spanish. And to see the Spanish captions for this conversation, please click on the link that um, my colleagues will be dropping and, in the chat box. Para acceder a la traducción simultánea al español de esta conversación, por favor haga clic en el icono de Zoom del globo terráqueo en la parte inferior derecha de, de la pantalla de Zoom y seleccione Escuchar en Español. Para ver los subtítulos en español de esta conversación, haga clic en el enlace que hemos compartido en el chat. So our guests will speak for 40 minutes before we open up the conversation. During the program, feel free to use the chat function to share general comments, um, they'll make sure that you change the chat mode to panelists and attendees so everybody's included. And once we begin the question and answer segment at the end of the presentation, please use the question and answer function rather than the chat function to pose the questions. If you wish to remain anonymous, please click that option before submitting the question. Now, um, we are very happy to have Andres and Melanie as our guests today talking about the influences of Virginia Woolf in the literature of Jose Donoso. Before they start, let me briefly tell you who are our wonderful guests. Dr. Andres Ferrada Aguilar is a professor of English, American, and Comparative Literatures at the University of Playa Ancha in Valparaíso, Chile, and at the University of Chile. He co-authored the book El Goce de las Olas, Lecturas en Torno a la Obra de Virginia Woolf in 2014, and is currently working on a book length study on urban landscapes in Jose Donoso's writings. His current project is funded by the government of Chile through Fondesit and the National Agency for Research and Development. Dr. Melanie Nicholson is a professor of Spanish at Bard College. Her publications include the books Evil, Madness, and the Occult in Argentine Poetry from 2002 and Surrealism in Latin American Literature, Searching for Breton's Ghost from 2013. She is currently working on a book that explores the bestiary and the beast fable in Latin American literature. Thank you so much, um, Andres and Melanie for being here with us. So now the floor is yours. Okay, thank you Paloma for uh, this uh, presentation. Um, before Melanie and uh, myself start this uh, conversation, I would like to thank um, the organization and the um, say planning of this event uh, that is led by the New York Public Library and all of the people involved in organizing this uh, very interesting activity. I would also like to thank all of the say, uh, people that have joined us today to listen to this uh, conversation. Thank you. You're muted, Melanie. 
Thank you, Paloma. Okay, and thank you to everyone. Um, welcome, everyone. I hope you enjoy the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, on Jose Donoso and uh, Virginia Woolf and some interesting uh, connections that my colleague has discovered in their work. I will start by asking Andres um, to just give us an ins a sense of how and when he, as a Chilean, discovered the work of Virginia Woolf. Um, well, that was uh, that took place uh, many years ago when I was an undergraduate student at Catholic University of Valparaiso in Chile, and um, in the in the I was I was studying English pedagogy, and in that particular program, we had a number of uh, courses that focused on English and American literature. So, in one of those courses, I became familiar or I started to become familiar with uh, Virginia Woolf's uh, novels. And I would say that the, the things that caught my attention at that time were the highly experimental, say, a form of writing that Virginia Woolf was, um, say, uh, offering us in her novels. Also, the this this sense of a stream of consciousness, and also the emphasis on experience, which gave us not only myself, but all of the, say, students, right, classmates that took those uh, courses, it gave us a very special sense that literature is not only concerned with external action, but pretty much with internal action. So, um, I also could say, realize that uh, language for Virginia Woolf expanded far beyond uh, what we conventionally know as communication. And her kind of language instead embraces also highly poetic and expressive elements. Yes, thank you. And for those in the listening audience who may not be familiar with the other figure of interest for this presentation, Jose Donoso. Could you tell us a little bit about his life and work? Thank you, Melanie, for, for the question. Well, um, Jose Donoso was born in Santiago, Chile, and uh, he died in 1996, right? And what is interesting about his literary career is that he was able to expand it throughout and beyond the say, Chilean cultural limits, encompassing uh, a very, I would say, a varied um, journey that took place in Spain, in the United States, also in Mexico. Um, indeed, uh, most of his important uh, novels were published while he was composing them, while he was writing them in in these countries, particularly in Mexico and in Spain. Uh, Jose Donoso is also uh, is strongly associated to what is known as the Latin American literary boom. And he became friends with uh, writers and authors such as Julio Cortázar from Argentina, Carlos Fuentes from Mexico, Gabriel García Márquez from Colombia, and Mario Vargas Llosa from Peru. Um, what is also very uh, interesting about Jose Donoso's literary career is his never ending insistence in overcoming the realistic scope of regional literature. Um, in an interview, he once said that uh, the unconscious memory was the element that he was highly interested in exploring in his literature. And he defined this unconscious memory as a fragmented memory, which is half memory and half fantasy. So that is a point that I would like to, to highlight. Uh, Jose Donoso's efforts to say surpass the limitations of a strictly realistic form of representing reality, representing experience. And uh, this, say, quest for a different literary languages is clearly, I would say, 
exemplified in a number of uh, recurrent motives that arise in his novels. A amongst them, we can mention the masking of identity or the questioning of whether there is an essential form of identity. Um, also also explores power relationships. And another very important point that has become quite relevant for me um, in my research is the way in which uh, Jose Donoso also is able to, to shape urban landscapes and to represent them in his most important uh, novels. And what do we know, Andres, about Donoso's relationship to Wolf's writing? How did he discover her writing? Um, what did he learn from it? I mean, that's going to be the um, the text of your presentation um, with the slides to follow. But tell us a little bit more about how you became interested in doing comparative work on um, these two 20th century writers. Uh, well, some some years ago, I read a passage in which I thought it was an anecdote, but then I discovered that it was, say, part of a, of a real situation. And uh, Jose Donoso uh, studied literature at Princeton University. And while he was preparing his dissertation, or actually while he proposed to work on his dissertation based on Virginia Woolf's novels, um, the academic committee um, strongly recommended Donoso to choose another author because back in the early 1950s, there was still very little critical research about Virginia Woolf. And um, what is even more interesting and more compelling to me is that Jose Donoso did not say give up the idea of working with a female or with a woman author. So instead, he focused his attention at that time on the writings by Jane Austen. So that is a, a preliminary or a first step towards right, encountering the literary scope of Virginia Woolf. Right? Um, Jose also therefore was quite familiar with Wolf's uh, novels and also her diaries. And uh, I would say that both writers emphasized the very strong correspondence between landscapes and uh, subjectivity. And also both uh, writers combine visual and also acoustic elements in their landscape representations. Right. So what is what is interesting to me to highlight is the notion or the idea that from a very beginning in her in his literary career, women writers were of particular, say, uh, importance for Jose Donos. If we take into account right, this preliminary exploration in Virginia Woolf and then in Jane Austen. And another very important point is that um, in an interview, he says that uh, one of the first novels that he read by Virginia Woolf uh, was precisely The Waves. He says that he read The Waves in translation in Spanish, and then he passed on to reading the novel into English. And given the fact that you mentioned Woolf's diaries and that he was familiar not only with her novels, but with her diaries. This is what brings us to the work that you were able to do at the New York Public Library and the Berg Collection this past summer. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your initial thoughts before coming and actually beginning that work. What were you hoping to find or uncover or new questions to be posed? Yes. Well, well, the Berg Collection um, houses a very extensive, I would say, archive of materials. So my time was very limited. So I had to be very selective. And within that selection, the focus of attention fell upon the way in which Virginia Woolf integrates acoustic elements and also rhythmic elements into their representation of space and particularly into their representation of landscapes. Um, 
And in concerning this, I would like to show you a slide uh, in which Virginia Woolf herself gives us an account of the way she understands on the way she envisions rhythm. So Paloma and the Caroline, I don't know, that's it. That is the, the slide that I wanted to, to share with you. And uh, Virginia Woolf writes uh, the following. It, she says that style is a very simple matter. It is a rhythm. Once you get that, you can use the wrong words. But on the other hand, here am I sitting after half the morning, cramped with ideas and visions and so on, and can dislodge them for lack of the right rhythm. Now, this is very profound what rhythm is and goes far deeper than words. A sight, an emotion creates this wave in the mind long before it makes words to fit this. And in writing, such is my present belief, one has to recapture this and set this working, which has nothing apparently to do with words. So what is interesting about this, say, reflection about rhythm is that clearly rhythm is for Virginia Woolf a pre-linguistic capacity that allows for the emergence of words, for the emergence of passages and even writing later on. So what caught my attention is, is how Virginia Woolf poses such a strong I would say trust on rhythm as a way to attain a definitive form for the novels that she is creating and also composing. According to this, right, rhythm becomes a cornerstone that is the basis for this huge building, this huge construction and complex at the same time, which is Virginia Woolf's writing and uh, fiction. Um, I would like to show you now uh, the, the original, uh, um, no, before, before that, before that, that's it, that's it. And now the next one, please. That is the, the slide that I want to show you because this is a passage that I took um, from the um, diaries by Virginia Woolf that are in the in the Berg <clears throat> collection. Sorry, and uh, this is the passage that is a uh, very uh, interesting for the purposes of this presentation. She writes, "The waves is, I think, resolving itself. I am at page one hundred into a series of dramatic soliloquies. The thing is to keep them running homogeneously in and out in the rhythm." of the waves. Can they be read consecutively? I know nothing about that. I think this is the greatest opportunity I have yet been able to give myself. Therefore, I suppose the most complete failure. Yet, I respect myself for writing this book. Yes, even though it exhibits my congenial faults. So again, what is compelling about this uh, reflection is the way in which Virginia Woolf is so sometimes relentlessly uh, critical about her own work and about her own shortcomings at the moment of, say, giving shape or giving form to the ideas she has got through this sense of rhythm. And now we can go on to the next uh, exactly um, slide that, that shows here, okay? A first hand, Virginia Woolf's handwriting, right? And the way she recorded these ideas uh, on her diary uh, on August 20th, 1930, right? So we can read here that the waves is, I think, uh, resolving itself. I am at page 100, right? And um, the, the important thing about this is the way she relates rhythm to the very image of the waves. Not the waves necessarily associated to the novel that she was at the time composing, but waves in the sense of a crucial image that goes from beginning to end in Virginia Woolf's 
writing. At very many stages of her writing, she uh, uses the waves as a symbol, as an image, as a metaphor for the novels, for the fictions that she is creating, but also she uses them as metaphors for the way in which she herself is unfolding her own autobiographical writing, right? So that is quite, quite an, I would say, an illuminating idea. Um, then in another passage from, uh, from another, say, uh, excerpt from the diaries from September 2nd, 1930, we can read the following. Um, I am more and more attracted by looseness, freedom, and eating when sitting off a table anywhere, having cooked it previously. This rhythm, I say, I am writing the waves to a rhythm, not to a plot, is in harmony with the painters. Ease and shabbiness and content, therefore, are all ensured. So here we come uh, across another very important idea right, which is Virginia Woolf's search for a plotless space of signification. So probably that is what uh, troubles us when we are firstly approaching her novels. One expects to find a traditional structure associated to conventional novels with a likewise traditional plot. Instead, Virginia Woolf gives more importance to the creation of atmosphere and to the delineation of characters who are not or which are not even characters. But in her appreciation of literary activity, characters are rather consciousness that move around the space of uh, writing with the fluidity associated to, in this case, the waves. Um, so, um, and in what comes in next, very good. This is a this is a very simple passage, right? In which Virginia Woolf uh, talks about um, a rhythm, but this shows the original, right? Uh, through her original handwriting. And we can read um, in the first part, I am more and more, and then attracted by a looseness, freedom, and eating one's dinner. So it, one, one has to, to remember that the, the basic, the fundamental condition for writing, at least for Virginia Woolf, besides the capacity of owning a room for one's self is also a sense of freedom. Without this sense of freedom, according to Virginia Woolf, it would be impossible to carry out the task, the task sorry, of, uh, say, unfolding the artist's mind into the process of writing and also into the process of creating fictions. And then I would like to show you right, this brief passage, which is a um, place at the very beginning of this very important novel, The Waves. And in this passage, we can already say testify to the importance of rhythmic elements, right, and acoustic, even acoustic elements, right, in the uh, say composition of the of the novel, right. Now we go down to earth or down to the earth of the narrative, the novel itself. And we can read the following. The sun had not yet risen. The sea was indistinguishable from the sky, except that the sea was slightly creased as if a cloth had wrinkles in it. Gradually, as the sky whitened, a dark line lay on the horizon, dividing the sea from the sky, and the great cloth became barred with thick strokes moving one after another beneath the surface, following each other, pursuing each other perpetually. So conceptually, and even in the way Virginia Woolf organizes phrases and words, we're giving a sense of rhythm, although the word rhythm in itself, of course, has not yet 
written, has not yet been written here in this uh, passage. And that's why I highlighted the last part, right, of this quotation, following each other, pursuing each other perpetually. Because in this passage, Virginia Woolf is referring to the movement of the waves, to the motion, to the never-ending motion of the waves. Uh, however, what is incredibly interesting to me is to see how this movement of the waves somehow also becomes a very good metaphor for understanding the interactions between the different consciousnesses or different characters in the novel. The novel um, depicts and uh, reflects the interactions of these uh, subjectivities right, of these voices, right, and the way in which they interact is very similar to the way in which, say, waves uh, interact and move uh, perpetually, as Virginia Woolf uh, says. And then uh, there is another uh, slide, um, which is also there at the very beginning of the waves, and we can read the following. I see your ring, said Bernard, hang above me, quivers and hangs in a loop of light. I see a slab of pale yellow, said Susan, spreading away until it meets a purple stripe. I hear a sound, said Rhoda, chip, chirp, chip, chirp, going up and down. I see a globe, said Neville, hanging down and drop against the enormous flank of some hill. I see a crimson tassel, said Jimmy, twisted with gold threads. In this slide or in this passage, what is relevant and what I want to share with you is the repetition of this I see, I see, and then there is a slight turning point with this I hear, and then again I see, I see. At the very beginning, of the sentence, we are presented with this anaphoric repetition, which somehow will set up the, say, continuous rhythmic progression of the interactions of the characters in the waves. And these interactions, as we know, are produced by the, say, interlacing of several soliloquies, which the, the characters produce. Right. So this is also very somehow intriguing to us because one tends to associate the soliloquy with the, say, emergence of one single character or one single subjectivity. In this novel, however, Virginia Woolf decides to overspread right, one single soliloquy and to pose it in the voice of another character as she said perpetually right pursuing each other following each other so that's why this say former right passage the previous uh, quotation is so is so very fine to me because it gives me a way of understanding how the characters interrelate within the novel as waves in perpetual motion right um pursuing each other and following also each other. Um, so, so that is important about uh, your question, Melanie, about um, the, the things that I they hope to, to discover in the collection and in Virginia Woolf's uh, writing. And there was another point that I wanted to, to highlight in relation to this, which is uh, the way in which Virginia Woolf also interacts with landscapes through her own experiences, which she translates into a modernist perspective in her novels, as we saw in the previous examples. Um, for Virginia Woolf, it is very important to, to combine her own experience and the literary experience, yet she is also quite aware of the importance of translating and transforming her own biographical experience into literary material. Um, and and as, to, as to the transformation of this, say, experiences, one of the, say, 
experiences that she is always trying to transform and to change is her own perception of landscape, her own experience of landscape. And in the following passage, we can clearly uh, see this, right? Um, this is Wolf's sense of landscape, and this has been taken from her diary from 1926. And we can read, in the evening or on colorless days, the proportions of the landscape change subtly. I saw people playing stoolball in the meadow. They appeared sunk far down on a flat board, and the downs raised high up and mountainous round them. The tilt was smoothed out. This was an extremely beautiful effect. The colors of the women's dresses also showing very bright and pure in the almost untainted surroundings. I know also that the proportions were abnormal, as if I were as if I were looking between my legs. So the point that was so very interesting about this particular passage that I found in her diaries in the collection in the archives was precisely the way in which she is also able to transform the conventional volume, the conventional shaping of language according to her own perspective of it. And when I talk about perspective in this sense, I, I, am, I am emphasizing, of course, this, this very strong sense of freedom and subjectivity that for Virginia Woolf is one of the basis for creating reality anew, right? And we can pass on to the following slide that shows precisely this, uh, this part, right? Uh, this passage is proportions change, right? So in the evening and on colorless days, and then the, the quotation continues. I, I wanted to say, to compare, to show you the edited passage, and then to show you the real, so to call, a passage on her diaries. Because the inflections, the pressure, the, say, even uh, little drawings and dots and uh, signs that she writes are also indicative of a state of mind and also of an emotional right, condition at the moment of writing. So the, the materiality of Virginia Woolf's writing is clearly expressed in her diaries when you are able to see them right um, by yourselves right and uh, and this is also quite compelling of the way in which we can finally discover that writing is not only a form of externalizing intellectual thought but also a way of say, pursuing an emotional condition or an emotional atmosphere that in this case allows Regina Woolf to keep on writing and to keep on expressing her fictions in the form of novels. So thank you for all of that, Andres. It sounds like um, given the chance to peruse the diaries, you had several of your previous insights largely corroborated. Um, and you found new detail in those. I'm wondering if there were in your work at the Berg, if there were new ideas or new directions for research that were suggested to you, things that maybe not, you hadn't thought of before your time in the Berg. Thank you, Melanie. One of the points that was particularly surprising to me was a, not only confirming, but also finding more ideas and more, say, materials associated to the importance that Virginia Woolf gives not only to rhythm, but also to space, atmosphere, and landscape um, as, a, as a resource to, to transform her own experiences into fictions, into, into novels, right? Um, currently, uh, I am working um, in an article in a study in collaboration with uh, 
Professor Cristian Montes from University of Chile. And in this article, we are um, right now exploring how rhythmic expression is associated to acoustic elements and also to the representation of urban landscapes in two um, very important novels by Virginia Woolf and uh, Jose Donoso. We are taking into account, of course, the waves, and by Jose Donoso, we are taking into account the obscene bird of night, el obsceno pájaro de la noche. And, uh, and also, uh, what is, say, compelling is to, um, is to verify the interaction between biographical experiences and literary works or the tight connection between the author's reflections recorded in their diaries and also in their novels, right? Um, I forgot to tell you before that Jose Donoso was also a very prolific writer of diaries. He kept so very many uh, diaries in which he recorded not only her, not only, sorry, his own personal experiences, but all of the experiences associated to the writing, to the planning, to the problematic process of, say, coming to terms with the novels that he was um, writing. So that is also a point that is uh, particularly interesting to me to see the importance that both Virginia Woolf and Jose Donoso pose on this, if you wish, extra literary form of writing, which are diaries, which in turn, when you read them carefully, are immensely literary. They always make use of figurative language to come across problems, crises, and situations that they are going through. So this is also, also meaningful to me. Sometimes it is difficult to draw a very clear, a very neat line between fictive writing and non-fictive writing, at least in the case of Virginia Woolf and uh, Jose Donoso. And uh, finally, to exemplify the way in which Jose Donoso employs a sense of rhythm, I would like to share with you a passage from El Obsceno Pájaro de la Noche, The Obscene Bird of Night, um, in which we can read the following. En las tardes, en el barrio Bullanguero de casas modestas que nos rodea, en casas también de teja y adobe, pero pintadas de rosa o celeste o lila o crema, se van encendiendo las luces, atronan las radios de las peluquerías y las panaderías, y los televisores y las cantinas repletas, mientras en ellas, en el taller de reparaciones de motos y en el espacio de compra-venta de novelas y revistas usadas y en el despacho de la esquina, se teje y entreteje la vida de este barrio que nos excluye. In an interview, Jose Donoso uh, recognizes that for Virginia Woolf, the strategy of using the semicolon was of immense help for her in order to break down the fluidity of thought or in order to break down the conventional say, continuity of sentence. And in this case, Jose Donos is not employing the semi-column, but he's employing the comma, right? And uh, also the, say, copulative form of this I, which is and, and the O, which is or. And with this accumulation of, if you wish, textual marks, right? syntactic elements, Jose Donoso is also able to, to introduce a particularly rich rhythm, which is a rapid, which is a speed-paced rhythm associated to, in this case, the, the creation of an urban landscape that is associated to the neighborhood in which the main events of the obscene bird of night take place in the novel. Right. So um, I have uh, now a question for uh, Melanie, because Melanie has also been uh, strongly working with uh, Jose Donoso's uh, 
novels. And this question, uh, Melanie, is, is the following. I would like to, to know how do you see the relationship between uh, Wolf and Donoso, in particular, as to their modes of representing space and uh, landscapes? Right. Um, thank you for the question. I was in particular work looking at when I was in, in Chile um, this summer, and since then I've been looking at um, particularly surrealist representations of space in El Oceano Pajaro de la Noche. But in terms of the connection with Virginia Woolf, I feel that if I could say it this way, Jose Donoso learned from Virginia Woolf, or at least both of them sort of drank of this rebaje um, of modernist uh, stream of consciousness writing in which there is really a, a seamless um, interweaving of physical space and landscape into the stream of consciousness, consciousness into the interior monologue or narrative um, of the characters. Um, it's hard to describe this. I, I, I brought along with me, and I'm gonna read just a very, very short passage from the translation of the Obscene Bird of Night into English. Um, the, the main character and narrator here is a man who we can say has gone mad. It's hard to describe his, um, his consciousness, but um, thinking in terms of this interaction or interweaving between paisaje landscape or, or physical space and the interior space of the character. Let me just read this little bit of a, what is a, min, a several page long um, exposition of his thoughts as he describes them to Madre Benita, who is an older woman who, uh, a nun um, in this convent where he has taken refuge as an old, um, basically, schizophrenic man. He says, but I'm not a thief, Mother Benita, I swear it. You don't steal your own name because it's yours and you do with it what you please. If only I could use one of those winter days when it gets dark early to burn all my papers, all my identical and reiterated names without leaving any traces. I'll throw them from this black steel bridge without, sorry, with, from this black steel bridge to the rocky riverbed. And after letting myself down there, I'll light a sheet of paper to maybe a notebook to warm my hands a little because it will be cold. That small lick of warmth won't be enough. I'll need more heat to fight off the terrifying bad weather. Other papers, français, vignettes, a week's diary I never finished, books lifted from public libraries, shout out to the New York Public Library there, public libraries where no one had ever borrowed them, notebooks filled with paintings in my shaky but vehement hand. Look, Mother Benita, the reddish circles growing at my feet. Listen to them, it's them, the ones who have no faces, joining my blaze one by one. Something stirs in the bushes. A dog comes and lies down near my fire. A shape's outlined against the waterline where rats fattened on garbage scurry off and take solid form, start moving this way. A chunk of granite wall trembles and falls. No, don't be frightened, mother. It's only a small boy who jumped from the mouth of the sewer. And so it goes. And so we have a dog, a boy coming out of a sewer. We have a bridge. We have a, a, a wall. There is certainly a physical space there, but it is impossible for the reader to uh, extract that sense of landscape or physical space or atmosphere or weather from what is going on in the mind of, of this narrator. Um, so I just thought that was one of uh, about a thousand possible passages that I could have taken out of this amazing novel um, to illustrate what I believe either they had in common or possibly that don't also learn directly from his reading of Virginia Woolf. Nice, thank you, Melanie. And it is very interesting to, to listen to you reading aloud the obscene bird of night in English, because we're talking about rhythm and we're talking about this uh, sense of landscape and definitely, right, um, the use of a particular language, right, uh, may also change our perception of the rhythmic progression and of the representation of the landscape and space, right? Um, Melanie, I have one more question. I guess that we have time for one more question. Do we have Carolyn, time, Carolyn, or should yes. we? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. 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 And and this question is is, is strongly associated to Santiago, Chile, 
which is the place in which uh, Donoso projected uh, as a space, as an urban space, the writing of uh, the obscene bird of night, the obsceno pájaro de la noche, right? So I would like to know what were your impressions when you, when you visited the, the library that Jose Donoso donated to the school, to the private school in which he studied in Santiago, the Grange School. Uh, this was a, a visit that we both paid um, last year in September, last year, 2022. So it will be very interesting for uh, the audience and the friends that are say listening to this presentation. Um, it will be very nice for them to know your impressions about your say so direct contact with uh, Jose Donoso's library there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, it was really interesting just to see this, this school where he had spent several years of his adolescence and where his love of English literature, literature written in English um, had been awakened. And the library itself was a marvelous experience. Um, I know um, that I, I understand that it was your second visit to the library, right, um, Andres, and that you were going back in particular to pull out those books by Virginia Woolf that he owned and to, to go through and look at the marginalia, the, 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 uh, the things that he had underlined in the notes that he had made. And I, I wish we had more time for you to share that experience with us. For me, as I said, I was working, I was, I was looking for evidence in his library of his connection to um, surrealism. And of course, I found books by Andre Breton, the head of the, 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 the initiator of the, of the surrealist movement, and um, a couple of other books um, by lesser known but important Chilean writers who were connected to the um, surrealist movement in, uh, um, in Chile. But um, it was also really just fun to see his incredible collection of, um, Andres mentioned the Latin American boom, which was the, the huge explosion of, of literary uh, talent in the 60s and 70s and the first time that Latin American literature really became widely translated and widely read and became an exciting um, site of literature for world readers. And he had so many things there and some of them with personal dedications to him by people like Nicanor Parra, um, uh, um, Carlos Fuentes, um, and others. So that was that was really fun for me, and I hope to be able to return sometime. Thank you, thank you, Melanie. I, I also hope you will you will come again, right, to to Chile, and probably we can go again to the library, and we may yeah. may find newer, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, insights into Jose Donoso's writing and maybe in connection to uh, British and American authors. Um, Caroline, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity of sharing this uh, presentation with the audience. Thank you too. Thank you so much, Andres and Melanie. Um, and I think we'd, we'd love to open it up to questions um, or comments from the audience. Um, if anyone has a question or, or comment, um, please drop that into the Q&A function um, or into the chat um, where we can all see. That would be great. Um, and while people are um, sort of typing in their questions or are thinking about it, um, I have one um, to maybe um, sort of kick us off too. It's been so interesting um, to, to think about um, landscapes in a very kind of like multi-layered sort of way um, today, the, the many different kinds of landscapes um, that we can encounter in literature and in writing. And as you were showing the slides from Virginia Woolf's diary um, from the handwritten pages, I was thinking about the, that, the landscape that we find there as well mm. um, in her margins and the, the slope of her handwriting. Um, and you spoke about Donoso as a diarist as well. And I was, I was wondering if um, the landscape of handwriting was um, in the mix also with, with, your, with your research and thoughts. Uh, thank you, Gerlin, for, for your question. Um, usually we can, usually we, we talk about um, the way in which landscape 
arising in writing, right? Uh, but we can also pose the different question, uh, which is associated to how writing itself may become quite a powerful visual, even acoustic, right, projection of the way in which the author is trying to reshape landscapes, right, as we traditionally know them, into fictive writing. So your question also, Carolyn, reminds me of the way in which at times her hand writing resembles the flapping, the going up and down of tiny waves, right? Mm -hmm. Waves which are quiet, waves which are in agitation, waves which are dormant even sometimes, right? So these this visuality and this very strong materiality of Virginia Woolf's handwriting gives us very precious insights, not only into her, say, psychological emotions, but also into the ways in which she somehow transforms writing into quite a physical, into quite a corporeal experience. Right. Writing is not only, in this case, the projection of a concept or the projection of an intellectual notion, but writing for Virginia Woolf in this uh, diaries becomes quite a compelling form of expressing herself in ways in which probably she couldn't have been able to, to do it in different forms, right? So, so th there is there is a, something corporeal, if you wish, about these pieces, right, that I have selected, and the very many that are there in the Diary Spy by Virginia Woolf, right? And I would like to make um, maybe a very crazy connection, right, that it may serve in order to illustrate the point. And the connection is following. It, many critics uh, that study the works, the poetic works by Walt Whitman, usually qualify her poetry as a very muscular form of poetry. And I also see muscularity, this vigorous form in Virginia Woolf's writings from a different perspective, of course. But what is behind the idea of this muscular proportion about this physicality is precisely the way in which the body in itself places, right, uh, at the front part as a very fundamental element that allows for the advancement of writing, that allows for the advancement of criticism even about that writing. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um... And uh, Paloma, I believe um, you had you had a question as well that you that you mentioned. You're muted. Sorry. Yeah, it's the, the since I'm I'm sharing my screen, it's complicated to do the controls kind of get all crazy. Um, um, I had a question about translation, and Melanie, I know that you you're a translator too. I don't know, Andres, if you're a translator, but also um, I'm very curious of how these uh, visual and acoustic landscapes, how, how complex they are to bring to another language. Just like uh, Andres was reading um, Donoso in, in Spanish, and then Melanie read in English. I, I kept thinking about that. How, how, what do you consider as a translator um, when in, in the process of translating, um, to respect and uh, those 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 uh, landscapes for a better word. Sorry. Well, that that's if I, if I might jump in, that's a really interesting question. I, Andres, have you actually worked on translating? I'm not sure about that. Uh, I have uh, translated uh, poetry, which is very complex. to continue 
con to continue to, I should say, uh, follow relatively closely the syntax and keep in, as, as Andres was saying, the punctuation is important to, to create that rhythm. This is a case where I would not try to make the English more readable or more um, syntactically clear, not at all. I think I would follow very, very closely um, and allow that that rhythm that, um, in, in this case, the, the, the rhythm of a, of a mad mind to play out on the page. Um, I think my my main um, my main complaints about this translation have to do with the dialogue. There's not very much dialogue, but where there is, I feel like it's kind of stilted, and I would like to rewrite that. So, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Melanie, um, and thank you, Andres, for sharing um, both your wonderful presentation today and the findings of your research with us all. Um, to our audience, um, please stay tuned um, for a blog post with the video recording of today's talk and links related to resources will also be emailed to everyone who registered for today's event. For everyone in New York City, I would encourage you to visit the library um, if you are able to, to see the related exhibition, uh, Virginia Woolf, A Modern Mind, which is on view through this weekend, closing March 5th. The exhibition is also online, and I'll drop a link um, to the online exhibition in the chat right now. We also encourage you to stay in touch with us um, for recently published biography of an American poet, Amy Clampett. Um, you can register for that event um, in a link in the chat as well. And again, thank you so much, Andres and Melanie, um, for your time today and for the wonderful presentation. And thank you so much to our audience for attending. Thank you all. Thank you very I much. I would like to, thank yes, you. thank you, thank you. I would like to, to thank the the New York Public Library for offering us right this wonderful opportunity to share right ideas um, and findings about in this case Virginia's uh, diaries and uh, Jose Donoso's novels. Right, thank you very much, and thank you to the audience for sharing this uh, presentation with us. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice uh, day, everyone. Bye.